Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Tim Bernard. I'm the director of the Local Government Records Office with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Uh, I'm here with my coworker, Lauren Harmon. Um, we help local governments, including libraries, with their records management. We also create handy retention schedules that tell you when you can dispose of your records, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Thank you for all, all for joining us today. I, it's going to take roughly an hour, uh, and there's a little participation in it too. So, um, hope you'll enjoy it. Hope you learned something. So, we're going to start by defining a record. Can get this thing. To, there we go. Yeah. Uh, the International Organization for Standards defines the record as information created, received, and maintained as evidence and information by an organization or person in pursuance of legal obli obligations or in the transaction of business. Essentially, it's documentation of an activity. The old line, if there's no record, it didn't happen, uh, holds true. Now, a record can be paper document filed, a form filed or created, a drawing or a map, even an email if it's related to your business, and much more. We often think of paper records, but most records nowadays are generated and stored electronically. A record is a record regardless of its format. Now, the Mississippi Code provides the following definition of a record for government employees. Public records shall mean all documents, papers, letters, maps, books, tapes, photographs, films, sound recordings, or other materials, regardless of physical form or characteristics, may to receive pursuant to law or ordinance or in connection with the transaction of official business by any agency or by any appointed or elected official. Uh, notice the phrase there in the middle, regardless of physical form or characteristics. Now, here's some types of records that you probably manage. Um, bank statements, canceled checks, correspondence, purchase orders, personnel files, payroll register, receiving reports. We'll talk about a few of these in a little while. Now that we have a better idea of what records are, we can define records management. ARMA International, the organization for of records managers defines records management as a systematic approach to the creation, use, maintenance, storage, and ultimate disposition of records throughout the information lifecycle. By systematic, we mean a fixed plan or method of approaching the records in your possession. Hopefully you can learn some of that today. Now people talk about a life cycle being circular, but with information, the life cycle generally is linear from creation, use, maintenance, storage, to ultimate disposition. And disposition can mean throwing it away, or it could be uh, con conveying it to an archives or somewhere like that for uh, permanent storage. Records management helps identify what is and what is not a record. It helps you determine what to do with the records that you have, and it helps you organize those records. Records management allows us to know what records we have and where to keep, where to find them. You can't manage a record if you don't know what or where it is. Proper records management makes it easier to find records when we need them. It also saves you money and space. Using appropriate boxes and shelving for your records can boost the efficiency of your record storage areas. It ensures that your inactive and active records are being stored where they need to be stored and aren't building up in inconvenient places. Now, it's helpful to keep in mind a concept that we call the law of thirds. In general, a third of an office's records can be disposed and another third can be stored offsite. Records management can also help with legal and compliance issues when dealing with discovery but during potential lawsuits or with auditors. Finally, records management allows us to identify essential records, which are those records needed for the continuance of operations, regardless of external circumstances. 
In short, records management answers the question of whether, how, where, and how long to keep a record. We'll examine each one of these a little more in depth. So the first thing you need to do is determine whether the document in question is a record at all. You do not need to formally destroy documents that are not records in the first place. Here's some examples of things that are not records. Basically records that you do not generate in the office, copies made for your convenience, and correspondence not dealing with official business are not records. Um, what we find in a lot of courthouses as we go around through counties are um, older versions of the Mississippi Code, and they have them stacked up and stored somewhere, but those aren't actually their records. Um, personal or bulk email, things like that are not records, not your records anyway. So what determines whether a document is a record? Well, it's a record if it has content inside that relates to official business and that your office has either created or received. Now you can keep a record in many different formats. Records are also kept in a physical format, often kept in a physical format, such as paper or even microfilm or electronically on a hard drive, a tape drive, a CD, a DVD, or some other format. It's important to note that the Mississippi Code considers electronic records to be just as valid as their physical counterparts. Records management principles are applicable to all records, regardless of their format. Now we'll talk about this part of it in a little more in depth later, but here's some guidelines as to where you should keep your records. You want to keep your active files close at hand where you can reference them easily. Now, if you've finished them and still need to reference them periodically, an in-house storage area would be in order. If you still must keep them, but rarely reference them, off-site storage may be cheaper. And then there are the permanent records that need to be kept, but you don't reference them that often. These records can be stored in an archive. Now, many counties partner with their local library or historical society for this purpose. Uh, you may be storing some of your county's records in one of your facilities. Now, even though we've been talking about individual records, realize that we are speaking of a record series. And that's defined as a group of related files that either are arranged or kept together by function or by subject. They may document a specific kind of transaction. They may take a particular physical form or they have some other relationship from their creation, receipt, or use. When we get into records retention schedules, we're talking about the record series. And that's how long to keep a record is determined by the re records retention schedule. And that length of time can vary anywhere from dispose at your discretion to permanent. Now, private businesses generally want to dispose of a record as soon as possible. But in government, there are circumstances where we want to hold it onto it longer. It's fine if you have the space. You can't just dispose of it sooner than the retention schedule permits. So when we develop a records retention schedule, we consider five values. First, there's the administrative value, how long and how often the record is useful and necessary in the course of business. The fiscal value, the auditory or financial value of a record. Now, the federal law says that if you get money from the federal government, you must keep these fiscal records at least three years after they've been audited. There's a legal value, how long someone can file suit using that record as evidence, depending on the statute of limitations for that particular type of lawsuit. Regulatory value, sometimes there will be a specific state or federal law that says you must keep this record a certain period of time. The historical value is probably the vaguest category. Some records have no historical value, while others have great value. So we consider each one of these values and then retain that record series for the longest. Now, fortunately, all this work is done for you. Our office does the research and presents new schedules to the local government records committee. Once new schedules are approved by the committee, we post them on our website. This is what one looks like. This is from our library schedule. On the top left, 
let me see if I can get a cursor up there. Here's the entity libraries. And then the, below it is the functional area. Oh, oh, I lost the cursor. Okay. Below that is the functional area arranged alphabetically. This may be a specific office or generic category that could be used by any office. In this case, we have circulation. Now, below that on the left is the series number. LIB is the general schedule for libraries. The 07 is a series number for circulation. And then they're numbered in order 1, 02, 03, 04, and so on in chronological order as they're approved. Now, this particular set happens to be in alphabetical order, but don't count on that. Next is a series title. Now, we've got 82 counties, about 300 municipalities, and somewhere over 50 library systems. So this title may vary from one office to the next. These are generic titles. So if it doesn't match your title, go and look at the description to see the function of the record. If that's what the record does, that's your schedule, no matter what the title says. And on the far right is the retention period, which, as I said, could vary until, until superseded. Uh, that third one down, uh, the top one is permanent, and it's everything in between. Now, to find the schedules, you can go to our website, mdah.ms.gov, select from the the list across the top, government records, and then in, in the drop down box under local government, select retention schedules. Uh, that will take you to what we see in the lower part of the screen that click on the blue box and then the list of schedules shows up underneath that. Um, as you can see, the fourth one down is libraries. Now, if you could take a minute, go to our website and open up the library schedule. We're going to use it in a few minutes. So I'll give you a minute to do that. And then when you get done, come back to the screen. Is that the uh, document that you had me send to everyone? Yeah, they should, they should have gotten a copy of that too. Um, okay. It's the same thing either way. Okay, just making sure. So if, if you've already got it, open it up and leave it on another screen, or you can go to the website and look it up that way. I just wanted to give them a chance to actually find it off our website. Our records committee meets up to four times a year. So um, anytime the committee meets and approves some schedules, we update those on the website. So um, usually we don't change anything, you know, the retention period or anything like that on the schedules themselves, but we do add new schedules regularly, so. Yes, uh, I'm Lauren Harmon, uh, his coworker. But since we do change it up to four times a year, if you look through the retention schedule and find something you wanna add saying, we actually need a schedule for this, or you wanna talk more about things, you can contact us and we can actually help you get new schedules approved as well for your records. Okay, uh, let's go on a little bit. We sh you should be there by now. Uh, remember records retention schedules are legal documents. Once they are approved by the local government records committee, they have the full force and effect of law. This is a, an example of those regu the regulatory value that I talked about a few minutes ago. So once we determine the retention of a record, then it becomes a regulatory value for those particular ones. Now, I do need to mention this section of the code that talks about unauthorized destruction of records and the divulging of restricted information. As far as I know, no one has ever been prosecuted for this particular thing, but would you not want to be the first? Generally, if your local newspaper or the TV station finds out about something like this, the bad media publicity would be far worse than any fine. So here's the little exercise I want to do um, to teach you how to read these retention schedules. This is a list of several common record series for you to find the retention schedule and the retention period. Think of what functional area each would fall under and then look 
for that series in, the sec in that section. Most of these are generic schedules for all local governments, but there's one down there by the bottom that's specific to the libraries. So the way we're going to do this, we're going to try it anyway. Um, Let's go down through them one at a time, look for purchase orders. And if somebody can find that and raise their hand, we can unmute you and maybe find it, um, share what you find. Now, unfortunately, I don't have any prizes to give away, but hopefully you'll be satisfied with learning how to do this. So here's our blank form. Has anybody found the purchase orders? And as Tim said, the actual, if it says libraries and then the title under, it's actually an alphabetical order. So you could probably guess where purchase orders would probably be. If you scroll down. Tim, someone has said GSL 0402. There it is. Okay. All right. Bank statements. That would be a financial record. That's a hint. Someone has said GSL 0206. Okay, good. Also in financial records, you'll find daily revenue reports. This is a real handy one for all kinds of things that you do in your daily work. GSL 0222, as someone said. Okay, good. Uh, now, um, minutes are the going to show up under administrative records. So that's up at the front of the list. We have GSL 0101. Okay, doing good. Also in the administrative records is routine correspondence. You probably get a lot of that. GSL 0109. Okay, good. good. Now patron records is the one specific to libraries. And I think we saw that under circulation a few minutes ago. LIB 0704. Yeah, very good. Now, accounts payable files, that's a financial record again. GSL 0201. Okay. Now, we didn't, we usually ask for the retention on these two. I forgot to do that. But um, as you look them up, you can see the retention period on these varies from one to the next. So, all right. Well, I hope somebody learned something here. Now, as Lauren said a minute ago, if you can't find an appropriate schedule, here's what you do. Call our office first. Maybe we can read those descriptions and make it fit into an existing schedule. Otherwise, we can do a one-time disposal authorization for a unique set of records or create a schedule just for your entity. Or maybe it's just one that we haven't gotten to yet. We can create a new general schedule. We haven't covered everything. So if you have a question, please call us. I've got contact information at the end of the program here. But if there's no schedule for your record, you cannot throw it away until there is a schedule created for it or a disposal authorization for a one-time disposal. Now, the retention schedules only cover how long you must keep a record. You can set up your own internal schedules as to where you keep that record. Here's an example. 
Keep your current year records in your office where they're handy for reference. At the end of the calendar or the fiscal year, depending on how they work, um, move them to a storage area somewhere within your building where they're still handy but not taking up that valuable office space. As the records are used less often, you can then send them to an off-site storage facility where they stay until the retention period runs out. Do this regularly every year so that the records don't pile up anywhere. You can do this for any of your recurring records like that. Once you have a good records management program established, you can achieve the goal of getting the right information to the right person at the right time. That's what you should strive for. Now, as I said, most records are nowadays are created in electronic format. So let's look at managing your electronic records. At their core, electronic records are made up of binary code ones and zeros or electronic on off switches that make no sense without a computer to interpret them. But sometimes these files can get corrupted and we can find ourselves in real trouble. Outdated hardware or software, viruses and other problems can all contribute to these issues. So we need to emphasize that while electronic records do not take up as much space as their physical counterparts, they require just as much management. Records management principles apply equally to both physical and electronic records, and we need to apply these principles to how we approach and protect them. Now, there are at least two places in the Mississippi Code that address the validity of electronic records. First is the Uniform Electronic Transactions Act, section 75121 through 751239, which states that an electronic record is legally valid. This set of laws has been adopted in some form in most states. While not spelled out specifically in the statutes, this also means that electronic records are subject to the same records retention schedules as the paper records. Now, the second place where this concept is mentioned is in sections 1915.3 and 21.15.37, which allows for paper records to be scanned by a county or a municipality if done according to MDAH standards, which we can find on our website, that digital image may be considered the official copy and the paper may be disposed of. Since your library is an entity of either your, of a municipality or a county, it can be covered by this, these statutes. So regardless of whether you choose to work with the vendor or scan your records internally, you must follow the standards and recommended practices set out in public records reformatting policy on our website. Same place you found the retention schedules, you'll find the list of standards. Two important points. These are mainly for the permanent records, but two important points, whether they're permanent or otherwise, is quality control, first of all. One person should do the actual scanning of the record, a second person checks the scanned image for completeness, accuracy, and readability. I learned from my mom, who was a secretary for years, you can't proof your own work. You need someone else to come back and look at it because you'll overlook the same mistake. The other thing is indexing. It's important to use consistent terminology and to utilize proper indexing so that you can find that record when you need it. Uh, a misindexed electronic record is probably harder to find than a, than a misfiled paper record. Another point in the public records reformatting policy is regular backups of documents and systems. Backups come in handy whenever a document is lost or when media is damaged. We highly recommend that your system backs up at least daily. That way, if something happens, whether it stems from human error or some external event, you can get back to business quickly. Sometimes the power will go out and whatever you're working on gets lost. You can go back to the day before's records and find it again. So when you've digitized a paper record, don't dispose of the physical copy until you've verified the electronic version has been back, backed up. Now backups can be short-term and long-term. A short-term backup could be something as simple as a hard drive that you keep in your office. 
Long-term backups are often backed up to servers offsite. You want to make sure that your data is stored in two geographically diverse locations. An industry standard for backups is the 321 rule. Make sure that you have three copies of your important records. The primary copy that you use, along with two backups, one of which should be on a different medium, which protects you against different types of hazards. Then keep one copy offsite, preferably miles away, as I just mentioned. If you're not using a vendor, partner with a library in another part of the state that likely won't be impacted by the same natural disaster. This slide shows why you want to store your electronic records on different types of media. There is no medium or software program for that matter that lasts forever. Oddly enough, magnetic tape is becoming popular again due to its longevity. It's good for backups, but it takes too long to search for active files. Be sure to replace any hardware or software that becomes obsolete so that you are keeping your records on working current media. You can't copy something onto a CD and toss it into a drawer, then expect to be able to read it 20 years later. In fact, our new computers, the one that I'm using right now, doesn't even have a CD drive. That, that's the way technology changes. Now that we've explored potential ways to store your electronic records, let's talk a bit about user security. Knowing what we can do to secure our records and protect them from threats such as hackers, viruses, ransomware, and more is critical to good electronic records management. Consider who has access to your, access to your computer when you're not around and whether your computer locks after a certain time once you've left it. You don't want anyone who's not supposed to be looking at your records to go snooping around. It's a good idea to lock your computer whenever you leave your work area, and especially in a library when you've got a lot of people wandering around. You don't want that somebody that doesn't have authority getting access to your computer. Having a strong, good password is one of the most important ways you can protect your computer systems and by extension, your records. Avoid using predictable things in passwords, such as family member names, pet names, or anything of the like. A good rule of thumb is that if someone can find information about you on social media, you probably should be not using that information as a password. Stringing together four or five different words, alternating capitalization, using symbols in place of letters are all good techniques to create a strong password that would be harder for hackers to guess. There's some examples there on the screen. There are browsers and generators that will create random passwords for you. Just be sure to have it written down somewhere, and that doesn't mean underneath your keyboard where somebody can flip it over and find it. Uh, the more random, the better the password. Be sure to keep your software and antivirus programs updated. It's important because those updates contain security patches that have fixed vulnerabilities that hackers have learned to exploit. This is frequently how viruses get into your computer. It's also a good idea to have only one antivirus program, as multiple programs may work against each other. Beware of any unsolicited links and attachments sent to you via email or pop-up ads, as well as extra software called bloatware that occurs when cer with certain downloads that can slow your computer down. Watch for those pre-checked boxes, even with legitimate software. Now, there's been a major rise in phishing emails and scams in recent years. These emails often promise free rewards in an effort to get you to click links so that they can collect your personal information. These kinds of emails can be convincing, but there are ways you can protect yourself from them. Don't click links or attachments on unsolicited emails. If something is too good to be true, it probably is. Check the domain name of the email address of the sender. No legitimate organization will use public email domains for business purposes. Make sure the actual email address matches the apparent sender. Scammers often customize the sender's name field so that it appears in the recipient's mailbox to have been sent by a legitimate organization. 
but the email address will be entirely different. Look for misspellings in the name field or in the email address itself or in the body of the email. Phishing emails often have sensational subject lines, but the body of the, of the email itself will be poorly written. Be wary of emails that try to create a sense of excitement or urgency in you. That's what scammers are counting on to make you click links that could compromise your information. So if you're still unsure, copy and paste the body of the email, don't click on it, into Google. Chances are that these scammers are, if these scammers are going after you, they've been doing it to others. Now, it's important to have protocols in place for when, especially when you're storing records directly on a hard drive as opposed to a server. You need a method for retaining your important records stored on your computer and making sure that anyone using the computer once you're finished with it won't have access to any data that you've left behind. The first thing you need to do when managing your electronic records is to figure out the types of electronic records that you have. Everything listed here can be a record, depending on its content, of course. If you created it, and it deals with official business, then it is a record regardless of the format. Now we get questions regarding how best to manage social media. Again, it isn't the format that determines if it's a record, but the content It's true for social media as well. So one thing to do is create and save all your social media posts as a Word document prior to posting it. That way, the that document becomes the copy of record and what you post online is just an access copy. Comments are where it gets a little tricky. If you can turn off the comment functionality so that they do not become a form of incoming correspondence that must be retained. If that's the case though, you have to save screenshots or use a social media archiving program and there are several on the market, but that's just another expense. Be sure to implement a social media policy so that all offices and employees handle it consistently. Now let's talk about how we should name our files. Good naming allows us to quickly determine whether to delete something because we can tell what it is. There are two parts to every file name. The descriptive name, that's the part you can control, and the extension, which is typically assigned by the program that created it. File name should be descriptive of the file's contents. So look at the examples below. Here, the third example is the best. It's an email policy from 2012, February of 2012, most likely. And this is the third version. The writer easily knows which version it is too. We highly recommend incorporating the series titles in the retention schedule for naming electronic records. That'll help you get at least part of the title into the thing, and then you can put in dates and things like that to identify it better. Here's some helpful tips, tips when naming your files. Use a dash, a capital letter, or an underscore for separating words. Don't use spaces. Different systems process those spaces in unique ways that are not always compatible with each other. And avoid using the special characters like those in the box there. These are programming symbols and that can confuse your computer. Sometimes it won't even allow you to use those. Organization is the key to managing your electronic records, whether it's documents on your hard drive or on your server or your email's inbox. Organize your do documents and your important emails into folders in a manner that works for you. We recommend organizing by the series title and retention period, by the subject or the project, by year when possible, things like that. The important thing is that you name your files so that you can find the things that you're looking for with ease. Sometimes you might want to name them that so that somebody else can fi find them after you're gone too. So don't get some weird system that only you're the only one that can figure it out. Now, in general, you can delete duplicates of electronic records if you have an official copy and no important information is added to it. 
This includes records in email format, digital images, and other forms of electronic media. Typically, your official record is going to be the one either created or sent by the originating office or person. This file needs to be consistently maintained and backed up for its retention period. Delete emails that are transitory correspondence, copies and duplicates, spam, bulk announcements, things like that. Do this regularly so that they don't pile up and become a problem. It may help to set a routine time to go through and delete unnecessary files and emails. Maybe a Friday afternoon when things are slow or something like that. Delete the things that are uh, retention periods have run out. And be sure to empty your recycle bin or your trash folder once you've finished. If they're still taking up space in the trash, then they really haven't been deleted. Now let's talk a little bit more on email for just a minute. As we've said, you should treat email the same way you treat your other electronic and paper files. In general, if you're not in an executive position, most of your day-to-day -day email will fall under either routine or the transitory correspondence. Per the retention schedules, email correspondence having to do with internal and routine matters following official policies only need to be kept for two years. Transitory messages that are more casual and not having to do with official policy only need to be kept as long as it's administratively necessary. Now, if you are the or your office is a creator of a record-worthy email, then it's your responsibility to maintain that email. Email sent to you from outside of your organization that can be considered record-worthy, well, you'll need to retain those as well. It would be smart to utilize folders for your inbox, just like we talked about earlier. While it's best to keep these emails electronically, every now and then you may need to keep it in a paper format. If you print out the email, you must make sure that the complete email, the sender receiver information, the server path, and any attachments are included in the printout, not just the text of the message itself. It has to take up, it has to include all of that to be an official record. Let me stop and get a drink for a minute. And we're going to talk about record storage. Now, this is more about your paper records. The ideal, in, the ideal storage environment for your records and actions you can take to ensure that your record storage areas are better equipped to protect your records will also... No, we're not going to do that. Okay. So let's talk about your storage environment, where you store your records. Ideally, your record storage area would be a building built specifically for archival record storage like the William F. Winter Archives building here in Jackson. That's where our main office is located. We're not in that building, but our main, our director and all official people are. Unfortunately, not everybody has access or the means to store records in a facility like this. Often you'll have to just make do with what you're given, but there are some things that you can do to make the situation better. You should inspect your building and storage areas regularly to appraise their condition. Inspect for damage to the roof, walls, and windows, leaks around the doors and windows and from the ceiling, and for signs of insects and mold. Uh, in these rainy season we had a couple of months ago, there were a lot of tornadoes and high winds and things like that. And if, especially if it's an offsite storage area, you need to check it periodically to make sure everything is still in good condition. Now, a stable climate is essential when storing permanent and long-term records. You want to keep your thermostat around 70 degrees if people work in the space. Um, if they don't work in it, you can actually get it cooler. Our um, archival storage areas at Winter Building are 60 degrees. You don't stay there much uh, for very long at a time. Uh, the humidity should be about 30 to 50%. If conditions are too dry, the records get brittle. If they're too damp, you're going to have problems with mold. Now, you want to make consistent readings of these numbers and monitor over time. 
you can get a digital temperature humidity gauge from your hardware store uh, for less than $20. Now, remember that the humidity is going to change as the seasons change. It will be actually drier in the winter and more humid in the summer. The best bet but most expensive answer to maintaining, maintaining a stable climate in your record storage area would be to install a central HVAC system. Now, if the records are being stored in a single room, a portable air conditioner unit or humidifiers and dehumidifiers may be the easier way to go. There are portable AC units available that vent either outside or into a wall, and they don't drain like a typical window unit that you see at the house. Be sure to repair and replace seals around doors and windows and any other openings such as vents. Improving the insulation can also go a long way in maintaining, maintaining a stable climate and can save you money in the long run. Now, all government buildings ban smoking, but if you're renting storage space from a private company, make sure that they don't allow smoking near your units either. In small, install smoke detectors in all record storage areas. It's a good idea to keep appliances away from your record storage areas as well, like microwaves and things like that. Learn how to operate your fire extinguisher. Often a small fire can be put out before it begins to spread. It's a good idea to have a sprinkler system in your record storage area as well. Although water can damage records and it's the most likely cause of damage to your records, it's easier to dry out a wet record than it is to reassemble the ashes. If you need more ideas, have your local fire department do an inspection and make suggestions based on what they find. Now, the most likely source of damage to your records will be water. Try not to put records directly underneath overhead pipes and know what's above your records if you have a drop ceiling. Often the pipes are hidden in that space. Clear, clear plastic sheeting can help divert water leaks. Keep your records off the floor. When flooding strikes, Records stacked on the floor can be some of the first things to be significantly damaged, especially in the basement areas. We highly recommend lifting shelving four to six inches off the floor. And we also recommend um, metal shelving rather than wood shelving because the wood can actually off gas and damage your records. Now it's important to know where water cutoff valves are. There was an instance in one county where the holding tank in a water fountain burst and flooded the upstairs room. The water trickled down the drain pipe into the record vault below. Thankfully, the clerk that worked there knew where the water cutoff valves were and managed to turn them off to avoid a major situation. This was at 445 on a Friday afternoon. Can you imagine what it would have looked like by Monday morning? Now, insects love to chew up books. We find this kind of insect damage in many of the counties that we visited. Um, get a contract with the local pest control company to spray for pests. Keep your record storage areas clean and do not allow food in them. That's just asking for trouble. I could show you some pictures that you don't want to see. Proper climate control will go a long way in curbing the mold growth but should, you should always keep an eye out for signs of an outbreak starting. While you can clean a few books of mold, a large outbreak will require professional help. Well, that's 45 minutes. So um, feel free to ask any questions. And if you'd rather ask privately, you can contact us afterward. Um, so I open the floor to questions. <laughs> 